I want to talk to you a little while then. I'm going to start the hind end work towards the front and suggest to you that the whole gospel is encompassed here in the third chapter, first thing. You got it? I wouldn't mind if you'd pay attention and follow me in the scripture tonight. And many times I'll give you time to turn to them. Here in the 14th verse of the third chapter, first Timothy, I open the scripture. These things write I unto thee, Paul's been writing to his young evangelist Timothy, hoping to come unto thee shortly. But if I tarry long, I've been writing these things to you that thou mayest know how thou oughtest to behave thyself in the house of God, which is the pillar, the church of the living God, the pillar and ground of the truth. And then the next verse tells us what the truth is, that the church of the living God is the pillar and ground of. And there's the whole thing comprehended in the 16th verse. Here in the King James Version, I read it first. And without controversy, nobody would argue about this, Paul said, Greek is the mystery of godliness. And here is the mystery of godliness. God was manifest in the flesh. Justified in the spirit. Keep in mind now, God's the subject of all of this. God was first manifest in flesh. God was justified in the spirit. God was seen of angels. God was preached under the Gentiles. God believed on in the world. And God received up in the glory. <sighs> Of course, the expression received up in the glory. That's the ascension of our Lord. I wanted, you can get a little of it, to read in three other versions, this 16th verse. You keep your Bible open, if you will. Here in the version that Brother Brown read from a while ago in Philip's translation of the New Testament, this 16th verse is described in more modern language. No one can deny that this religion of ours is a tremendous mystery. Resting as it does on the one, praise God. He's the foundation, isn't he? He's the pillar of the ground, is that right? He is the truth. Our brother Heaslip magnified that to us the other Sunday. He is the truth. Then in truth, except in him. No one can deny that this religion of ours is a tremendous mystery. <clears throat> Resting, it sinks or falls, as it does on the one who showed himself. as a human being. Now, you don't believe that, and I don't either, but the New Testament says that God became a man. You don't believe that, do you? You just can't believe that, can you? Huh? We don't no more believe that no more. He is some sort of a something, but he wasn't a man, but he was. And that's the reason oftentimes I tell you, won't it be awful if you're a man, a member of the human race, either male or female, and you go to hell in spite of the fact that God went through the trouble of becoming a man, just like you are, so he could get to where you are and do for you what you need. Brother, there ain't no excuse or last one of you got for going to hell. That's the most tremendous thing that ever happened. Now, brother, I couldn't have thought that up, and I couldn't explain to you in a million years, but that's the whole point of it. Great is the mystery of our religion, resting as it does on the one who is the one God, who showed himself as a human being. 
And there's some people who lived on this earth and they wrote it down so I can read about it. They said they handled him and they touched him. He's a man. He got hungry. Had to have something to eat. He got thirsty. And had to have a drink. He got tired. And had to rest. We don't believe this. He didn't know everything. He said he didn't. He was a man. Man. Now, isn't that a mystery? Isn't that a mystery? The heathen can take Christmas and raise hell all they want to, but you listen to me, Christian. That's the beginning of the visit of God Almighty in the flesh to this whole earth, and it's high and holy and sacred. And that baby was God, and yet he was man. That's a mystery. You'll never have the slightest idea what salvation is unless you remember that it is man that did the sin. And therefore, it's man that's got to make things right. And the only way that even God could save you, Richard Carter, you had to become a man in order to do it. So that a man, a man could atone for his sins. Now, let's read this again. No one can deny that this religion of ours is a tremendous mystery. Resting as it does on the one who showed himself as a human being and met as such every demand of the spirit in the sight of angels as well as of men. Then after his restoration to the heaven from whence he came. He's been proclaimed among men of different nationalities and believed in in all parts of the world. Glory to God. And then Berkeley translation, this same verse, and confessedly the hidden truth of godliness is great who was revealed in the flesh, <clears throat> vindicated by the Spirit, seen by angels, heralded among Gentiles, believed in by the world, and taken up in glory. And then the Amplified Version reads like this, and great and important and weighty, we confess, is the hidden truth, the mystic secret of godliness. He, God, was made visible in human flesh. <coughs> Justified and vindicated in the Holy Spirit. He, God, was seen by angels, preached among the nations, believed on in the world, and taken up in glory. That's the story of the Lord Jesus Christ. That's the gospel. That's the gospel. I wanted just to lay a little foundation tonight Next Lord's night, the Lord willing, I want to go through some of the teaching of the Apostle Paul and get some of the glory that's in the Word of God on this subject. And him who is the subject, he is the one who ascended. Now the reason that next Sunday night I'm going to start with Paul is that in the writing of the New Testament, we all know. Now this, maybe I better take a moment on this. I wouldn't insult your intelligence by uh, calling your attention except some of your babies. We're likely to get the impression, since we opened the Bible, Matthew's the first book in the New Testament that is written first. Oh, no. The book, all of the epistles of, of Paul were written before any of the Gospels. So if you want to get to the earliest writings 
that God inspired. And we don't believe this, you know. We've been taught what we believe about the Bible. But these people were men wrote the Bible. God bossed it, but men wrote the Bible. Huh? And Paul is the first one to talk about the glory and what results to God's people from Christ having been raised, not from the dead simply, but ascended to glory. You see, there's a vast difference between the Lord's resurrection and the Lord's ascension. The fact that Christ was raised from the dead proves that death has been conquered and that I be raised from the dead. But the fact that he ascended to glory proves not only I'll get out of the grave, but I'm going to land in glory. Isn't that wonderful? And so this Christ, who was born as a baby, and wound up sitting at the right hand of God. He's won my face then. If I get to heaven, it'll be because he was born as a baby and lived a perfect life and died on the cross and was raised and got back to glory there to appear, the scripture says, before the face of God for over our part. <laughs> ah! Praise the Lord. Now, salvation's in here. I labor that a little bit. Because you, I don't want you to go to hell believing these facts. But I said, well, boy, I believe that it. it is so. I believe in the virgin birth of Christ. They'll raise hell about old brother Tribble out here. He says he don't. Well, you could believe that and still not have him. Still not have him. See, you can believe that. But it's not salvation isn't in a that. Salvation isn't in the virgin birth. Salvation isn't in the life of Christ. Salvation isn't in the death of Christ. Salvation isn't in the resurrection of Christ. Salvation isn't in the intercession of Christ. Christ. Salvation's in Christ. 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 I want your faith to be in a person. Not a person who didn't die, but a person who did die. Not a person who didn't rise from the dead, but the person who did rise from the dead. And a person who's now in glory is the pledge that you'll be there if you join to him. Now in the Old Testament, there are two men, of course, in the Old Testament that were ascended to glory without having to die. One of them is and the other is Elijah. Now I'm not going to take the time tonight to go into those scriptures, but in the fifth chapter of Genesis you have the story of, of, of Enoch. And I seize upon the word that the scripture says God took him. God took him. And then in the second book of Kings and, and uh, uh, what chapter is it? Second chapter, I think it is. In the first verse, you have the story of the ascension. He's taken up chariots, what? He just went from right here up to there. Well, praise God, I am too sometime. I'm going to come out of that grave and I'm going to clear it up. And the same word there is take. Now, in the Old Testament, listen to me. In the Old Testament, nobody believed in resurrection or ascension. When a man died in the Old Testament, he went to Sheol, and as far as they knew, as last to him. You remember the controversy when the Lord was sharing the flesh between the Lord and the Pharisees and the Sadducees. Now, the Sadducees were the fundamentalists. They believed the Old Testament book by book and kiver by kiver. They did not believe, what does the scripture say? In a resurrection. Huh? But the Pharisees were modernists. They believed in a resurrection. They were liberal. That's right. The old Sadducees, they took everything in the Old Testament and they took right down the line, letter by letter. And there wasn't any ascension. There wasn't any resurrection, according to them. See, they didn't leave there's a resurrection. And so here's Enoch, and the sense is that he was a good man, 
Now, watch it now. That he was so good in the sight of God that he didn't deserve to die. But he did deserve to be taken to glory. And the same is true of Elijah. He was such a good man. God looked at him and said he deserves a better fate than to go to Sheol. And God took it. And thus they both are clear types of him who in 2 Corinthians 5 and 21, him who what? Knew no sin. Bless God, he is ascended too. God took him back to glory. Praise the Lord. See? Now that's a beautiful thing. If I can be joined to Christ, then God reckons me as to be too good just to go down to the pit. And one day, as I'm joined to him, praise the Lord, I'm going to be taken to be with him. That's right. Now, while the Sadducees didn't see it, because they were literalists, the Pharisees did. There are four songs. As far as I know, there are only four songs and all of the teaching, as far as I'm able to get, about the ascension of the Lord is prefigured, is given in these four songs. And I wanted just to read some excerpts from them tonight. The first one is Psalm 68, if you'd like to turn to it. And here in Psalm 68, I'm going to be reading from the authorized version. You can follow it in whatever version you have. Here in the 17th verse, in the 18th verse of the 68th Psalm, we've got a marvelous prefigurement or a picture of the ascension of the Lord Jesus Christ. And we'll learn in this discussion how the Apostle Paul changes the language here in verse 18 when he comes to write. Here in verse 17 we got a picture of the, of the uh, convoy of angels that uh, escorted the Lord Jesus Christ when according to Paul, him who was manifest in the flesh and was justified in the spirit, and was seen by angels, and was preached among the nations, and was believed in in the world, and was received up to glory. And the psalmist gets a picture of a convoy of angels that are going along escorting the Lord Jesus Christ as he goes from this earth at and go up to be with the Father. Here, in the chariots of God are 20,000, even thousands of angels. The Lord is among them as in Sinai in the holy place. Thou hast ascended on high. Thou hast led captivity captive. Thou hast received gifts from men. <clears throat> For men, ye for the rebellious also, that the Lord God might dwell among them. And then in Psalms 47, there is a reference to the resurrection of our blessed Lord. In verses 1 and 2, we read first, Psalms 47. O oh, clap your hands, all ye people, shout unto God with a voice of triumph, for the Lord Most High is terrible. He is a great king over all the earth. Then verse 5, God is gone up with a shout, the Lord with the sound of a trumpet. Sing praises to God, sing praises, sing praises unto our king, sing praises for God is the king of all the earth. Sing ye praises with understanding. God reigneth over the heathen. God sitteth upon the throne of his holiness. The princes of the people are gathered together, even the people of the God of Abraham, for the shields of the earth belong unto God. He is greatly exalted. Now, you know, that's about the Lord. Well, the, the New Testament writers quote from these scriptures. I don't think I called attention to that. I don't know how much reference there is to the ascension of the Lord 
in the Old Testament. I simply know, as far as scholars have been able to find out, the only references to the going up into heaven itself of the Lord Jesus is found in these four Psalms. In Psalms 24, we got a blessed picture of how the Lord was received when he got there. And this is blessed because he went up there for me. He went up there for me. And I sure am interested in how he is received when he got there. In verse 7 we read, Lift up your heads, O ye gates, and be ye lift up, ye everlasting doors, and the King of glory shall come in. Well, who is this King of glory? Well, he's the Lord, strong and mighty, the Lord mighty in battle. Lift up your heads, O ye gates, even lift them up, ye everlasting doors, and the King of glory shall come in. Who is this King of glory? He's the Lord of hosts. He's the King of glory. And the Old and New Testament writers quote that psalm several times. And then in Psalms 110, right quickly, we have another beautiful reference to the ascension of our blessed Lord. Beginning at verse 4 of Psalms 110, we read this expression. Jehovah has sworn and will not repent. Thou art a priest forever after the order of Melchizedek. Jehovah at thy right hand shall strike through kings in the day of his wrath. And here's a picture of the enthronement of the Lord Jesus Christ at the right hand of God, not only as king, but as priest. Not just an old flesh and blood man. Our enemy is the power of the devil himself. And watch it now. We wrestle not against men, but we have to do in the spiritual realm with powers and principalities under the control of Satan. Demonic power, devilish power, satanically inspired power. But praise God, Watch it now. In, 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 although this old world is under the prince of the powers of the air, and the devil is the god of this world, and we have to struggle with him, I turn to a scripture like Ephesians, and I read first in the first chapter, verses 21, verse 20 and 21, and then I want to hook it up to one verse and just joy in it just a moment. We are wrestling. Why, we get everybody in Winston-Salem to God before tomorrow night but for the power of the devil. He's our enemy. He's our enemy. He's our enemy. He's the one that gives us a rest of the match. He's where we're the center of our fight. Now watch it. Praise God. Look at it. Ephesians 1 and 20, which he wrought in Christ when he raised him from the dead and set him on his right hand in the heavenly places. That's his ascension. Far above all principality, bless God. He got more power than the devil and power and might and dominion every name that is named, not only in this age, but also in that which is to come. When God raised Christ, he made him sit there in his right hand, above, over. Praise God. He got the whole world in this seat. And we see not, Paul said, all things yet subject to it, but he's working at it. He's working at it. He's working at it. And he included us in this battle. For in Ephesians 2 and 6 I read that not only did God raise him and set him above every power and dominion and principality and might, 
but it says he hath raised us up together with him. Wish we believed that. Wish we could enter into that. I tell you, we got no right to let the devil defeat us. We got no right to let anything defeat us. He's raised him up. And he's raised us to sit together with him. In the mind of God, there's a man in glory, and I'm there too. And he raised him to exercise lordship and sovereignty and rule over this whole universe and bring it unto subjection unto him. He said we had to share in that. And I get this, brother, even though I can't believe much of it. Brother, victory is ours. Victory is ours. Victory is ours. I give my two arms. If I knew how to teach and preach it, it's also teach and preach to myself so we could change our tune. Let me just give this brief word and I'm through. I used to be associated, I'm not very proud of it, with Dr. J. Frank Norris. And wherever he went, he built another new church, built a church to go run down, dead church in Detroit, kept his church in Fort Worth. In three, four years' time, he had thousands of people joined, and me much to join. But the way he did this, his workers went out, and they had the greatest Sunday school class in the world. They had the greatest preacher in the world. They had the greatest church in the world. They had the greatest services last Sunday that ever had. Next Sunday, they'd have the greatest one that ever had. And they didn't know how to use more, they said most. They never use the word better, they said best. And I don't much like that bragging on a man. But oh my soul, this town got plenty of church membership. This town got plenty of religion. I tell you what's the fact. This town don't care much about the wonders of Christ, the power of Christ, the might of Christ, the place of Christ. Oh, if we brag on him. If some of it entered into us, oh, my soul, we don't try to get somebody to quit one place and join another, folks in the factories and towns. Their conception of Jesus Christ is mighty low. Paul said, brother, he's been raised. He's head over everything. He put up there to start the job of bringing this whole world under subjection to himself. It's time to quit apologizing for believing in Christ, brother. He's the one God's turned this outfit over to. It's time to begin to magnify him. He's going to win, brother. He's going to win. He's going to win. He's already dealt the death blow to the devil and his crowd. Praise God. And the old snake's tail's still wiggling, but if victory is already certain, and victory is certain for those who share in his victory, for he hath raised us to sit together with him in heavenly places in Christ Jesus. Where is this one who was a baby? Where is this one who wound up on a cross? Where is this one who was seen of many people? Where is this one he's been exalted, bless God? Where is it? He's been exalted. He's been taken up. God took Enoch. God took Elijah. God took Christ. He exalted him. And having received of the Father the promise of the Holy Ghost, now the exalted Redeemer has done what? has shed forth this which you now see and hear. We're saying he didn't went up there and received it from the Father. He sent the Holy Ghost. Huh? Well, and in that preaching of Luke chapter 3, at verse 13, the God of Abraham and of Isaac and of Jacob, the God of our fathers, 
that glorified his son Jesus, whom ye delivered up, and you denied him in the presence of Pilate, when he was determined to let him go. And bless God, God said he, he exalted him, he glorified him, you killed him, you, you, you denied him, you crucified him, but God's exalted him. Yeah. And then in Acts 4 and 11, neither is there salvation in any other, for there is none other name under heaven given among men, whereby you must be saved. He's talking about this ascended Lord. Now, just one other scripture, just to set the pattern, what I hope to go in next Lord's Day night with you. I want to read Paul's, just one statement from Paul. Here in the second chapter of Colossians, King, let me have Phillips there at, at the second chapter. I want to read it at verse 14 and 15 in the King James. Thank you, sir. Here in the authorized version, we read, talking about the work of our Lord, blotting out the handwriting of ordinances that was against us, which was contrary to us, and took it out of the way, nailing it to his cross, and having spoiled principalities and powers, he made a show of them openly. How'd he do it? He drug them with him, bless God. Triumphing over them in it. Woo! Here's my Lord going back to glory. And he got the devil in his hand and all his imps in this. He just, he said, I got you. Uh, huh? He, how, how? While he was down here, what to do? He became the conqueror. And here he is, ascending, dragging at his chariot wheels, the infernal host of hell, and openly showing them the God's holy angels as vanquished prisoners. What does let me read this. Christ has utterly wiped out the damning evidence of broken laws and commandments which always hold humbled our heads and has completely annulled it by nailing it over his own head on the cross. And then having drawn the sting of all the powers raised against us, he exposed them, shattered empty and defeated in his final glorious triumph and hallelujah what a saint the longer I live the more I'm coming to see I don't understand nothing about the gospel but I want to rejoice in him oh he's worthy only he is worthy. He took the sting out of everything that's against us, praise God. Huh? Yes, sir. He did. I wish I could believe that, don't you? Amen. Look, ye saints, the sight is glorious. See the man of sorrows now from the fight returned victorious. Every knee to him shall bow, crown him, crown him, crown become the victor's brow, crown the Savior, angels crown him, rest the trophies Jesus brings, in the seat of power, enthroned him. While the vault of heaven rings, crown him, crown him, crown the Savior, King of Kings. And we'll be interested as I call your attention time after time. When my Lord went back, raised him from the dead, that's fine. 
But here he came down from heaven to do something, and he had to go back and make a report. And when he got back after having purified us of our sins, he sat down. And the Father is satisfied with his blessed Son. And as far as I know, saving faith is just to be satisfied with the Lord Jesus Christ. Amen.